This is an exchange, which I think just says a lot, uh, where you're approached by a self-described pansexual. Hmm. Here's what happened next. I was just wondering, Emily, what were your opinions on the LGBTQ plus community? community? Well, I don't think it's one community. Really? Yeah. I mean, how could it be? Just mashed together in alphabet soup. Trans is fundamentally in tension with gay, if you ask me. But what's your opinion? I am personally a pansexual, so I was okay. just wondering what your views on same-sex couples were. I don't have a negative view of same-sex couples, but I do have a negative view of a tyranny of the minority. So, so I think that in the name of protecting against a tyranny of the majority, and there are times in this country's history where we have had a tyranny of the majority, we have now, in the name of protecting against tyranny of the majority, created a new tyranny of the minority. And I think that that's wrong. I don't think that somebody who's religious should be forced to officiate a wedding that they disagree with. I don't think somebody who is a woman who's worked really hard for her achievements should be forced to compete against a biological man in a swim competition. I don't think that somebody who's a woman that respects her bodily autonomy and dignity should be forced to change clothes in a locker room with a man. That's not freedom, that's oppression. And so I believe that we live in a country where free adults should be free to dress how they want, behave how they want, and that's fine. But you don't oppress, you don't become oppressive by foisting that on others. And that especially includes kids because kids aren't the same as adults. It's just a beautiful answer in so many ways, but I, I, I just want to parse your initial answer, three parts about it I love. She comes up and says, what are your opinions of the LGBT community? First, you question the premise of the question itself. How is it a community? Trans is fundamentally in tension with gay, as you say. That's not a community. I agree with that. Second, um, you're completely calm and you explain yourself. And third, you say, what's your opinion? Yeah. And you throw it back to her. But to, to the first thing, Trans is fundamentally in tension with gay. I've not heard anybody say that in public. What do you mean? Well, I mean, even, I mean, first of all, it's just starting with the L and the G. Most lesbians don't like gay men and vice versa. But then now you keep adding. I don't think you can say that. It's too true. Uh, and, 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 then, and then you, and you sort, of, sort of like further start playing this out. Wait, wait, wait. wait trans wait, is this totally weird separate thing. That's like, so like, you're just like mashing this like alphabet soup just to create an us versus them destruction of, of modern order. Sorry, which, I should say I, I do. Someone in the studio is nodding. Who would know? What you just said is true. It's it's the uh, truth. I mean, really. And so, you know, the, the 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 truth is, let's just take. I mean, we could we could have a lot of fun with this one, but just take some of the suppositions here and see if this logically makes sense, right? Like one of the suppositions in the gay rights movement, which you know I'm totally open to this, but it's just partly of how we created gay rights in this country, is that the sex of the person you're attracted to is hardwired on the day you're born, even though there is no gay gene. That's the, now if you make it one movement, the LGBT movement, that's the same movement that also now says that your own sex is completely fluid over the course of your life, even though there is a definitive sex chromosome. Like you can't believe these two things at the same time. They're fundamentally it's nonsensical. It's nonsensical. And so and so that's what it reveals what's going on, Tucker, is that these are cult-like belief systems, right? Because yes. if it's a religious cult, then you don't have to, I mean, you don't have any obligation to logic if you're subscribing to a religion. And the worst religions are the ones that fail to recognize themselves as religions. I think religions can, religion can be a great thing. You and I are both pro-religion, pro-faith, if we recognize that we're actually exercising faith. But the most dangerous religions of all are those that claim to be secular, but are actually religious in their conviction. And one of the ways you can smoke out that it's religion is just these inherent tensions that L then you give it a flag, then you give it a symbology, you give it an idol. The first idol was not good enough, the rainbow flag. Then they had to make the trans flag, the upgraded version, the golden idol. They started with the silver one. And so this is what this is about, is a form of idolatry in the trans flag that is a symbol of a broader religious conviction. It's kind of the same thing you see in the climate movement, actually. is like I, I kind of enjoy this because you get to the bottom of what's going on by exposing the illogic of it. Right? Like on the climate, there's a parallel for what's going on with LGBT with climate. You think two different issues. What, what are you talking about? Well, the same people who are antithetical to carbon emissions here in the United States are perfectly fine with shifting those carbon emissions to China, even though it was supposedly global warming that we we're addressing. Or the same people who are hostile to carbon emissions are also hostile to nuclear energy, which is the most productive form of carbon free energy production known to man. Again, you can't believe both of those things at once unless you're subscribing to a broader religious worldview. And I think that religion is actually, it's the same religion, whether it relates to the climate dogma, whether it relates to LGBTQIA plusism, whether it relates to racial wokeism, 
it's a broader vision that defines itself in opposition to the American vision, to the American way of life that says we are individuals, individuals who are members of these units we call families, families which are embedded in the substructure of this thing we call a nation and a nation which exists under the broader blessing of God. Individual, family, nation, God, that is one worldview. And the thing we're describing here is an alternative worldview grounded in race, in gender, in sexuality, in climate. And one of the things that I feel for some of the people who subscribe to this religion, I somewhat felt for this woman, right? She wasn't, you know, she, there are others like her. There's another one actually at the Iowa State Fair who had similar beliefs that did not comport him or her or they self, whatever this individual was in the same civil manner that this woman did. Uh, he was ring he had a cowbell and it was ringing and was, um, you know, was, um, you know, antithetical to having conversation. This woman at least having a conversation. I kind of felt for her because what I saw in her eyes for sure. was she is not she's not an evil person who's trying to see be a crusader for some faith to put the other side out of business. Those people exist. She was just lost, actually. Right. I don't know if it was harder to see on the on the camera, but I was face to face with her. And, I, and it's, when I see that, it's why I also thanked her. I said, thank you for being civil in your exchange. And I'll give you the same courtesy in return. I mean, she, she was I, early 20s, best my guess. She's lost. There's a void there. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it's so, so I asked her the question back. There's a blank stare you get in a response. It's almost the same blank stare as if I get asked most young people on a given day, what does it mean to be American? It's that same blank stare. That's the void. It's like a deer in the headlights. And I think that this is our moment, our duty, our job as leaders. It's the job of the next U.S. president. It might be the most important one of all. To fill that void with an answer to the question of what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be you? What does it mean to be an individual rather than riding a tectonic plate of group identity? What does it mean to be a member of a family, a nuclear family with a mother and a father that by definition brought you into this world? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a citizen of this nation? Not some nebulous, vague global citizen fighting climate change. No, 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 but a citizen of this nation on this land with these ideals. What does it mean to believe in God, to be a nation under God? I think that's our moment. And I believe that if we fill that void with an actual affirmative vision, we will dilute these other poisons to irrelevance. They are symptoms. They're symptoms of a deeper cancer. That cancer itself is a void, a black hole. Fill that void with an actual affirmative vision of who we really are. That's got to be how we win. And the thing that frustrates me most, actually, about the Republican Party, Tucker, isn't even you know, the neoconism in our foreign policy. And I mean, it frustrates me deeply, but this, this feels solvable through an alternative set of policies, right? I can go do deals on right. a global stage and, and let's hope I'll be successful if I'm in that seat. I think I will. But this is actually the deeper challenge. You can only stand up with the spine abroad or in an economy or whatever, if you at least first know who you really are. And I think that is the far more difficult question. It's not going to happen through policy, but somebody, it doesn't have to be a US president. It could be it, it, it could be someone who has a as a media outlet. It could be a religious figure, but it could be a parent. Maybe it's not one person, maybe, which is what I think the real answer is going to be. Maybe it's going to have to be leaders in the different spheres of our lives, each stepping up and speaking with conviction to the question of answering who we really are. And I think the U.S. president has a role to play there in answering who we are as Americans. And the thing that really frustrates me back about the Republican Party is, you know, I wrote Woke Inc. a couple of years ago. You were kind enough to help me launch that book with you. And we had a great conversation and you know, a lot of people read it. And, and then you know, the Republican Party starts reciting memorized chapter and verses from, you know, not just my book, but maybe others like it, but mine included. But without actually knowing like what they're even talking about, they understand the word. They're, they're uttering the words, but they don't really understand the phenomenon they're addressing which stops you from actually getting to the true solution, which is actually understanding that there's a deeper void and vacuum that we have to fill with an affirmative alternative vision of our own. That takes courage. That takes vision. That takes some level of imagination of what is actually possible. 
don't have to imagine it too much. It's been true for most of our history. So he can maybe just draw from that. That's how I do it. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Let's maybe just borrow from the people who set this thing into motion. They had a pretty good idea of what they were doing. But that's what this moment calls for. And either we rise to that occasion and we take that 1776 spring spirit and we channel it into a revival of that once more. Or else we will be the Israelites lost in the desert asking to go back and be ruled by the Pharaoh. And that's exactly what this nation is otherwise on a march to actually towards being ruled by, you know, quietly becoming a people of sheep so our government can be a government of wolves. That's a perfect analogy.